All right, I wanna uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Carlos Valiente, I'm a professor at Arizona State University, and I'm excited to introduce Dr. Albert Chang, our presenter today. Um, Dr. Chang is an assistant professor in the Department of Education Reform in the College of Education and Health Professions at the University of Arkansas, where he teaches courses in education policy and philosophy. He is also a senior fellow at CARDES and an affiliated research fellow at the Program of Education Policy and Governance at Harvard. Today, Dr. Cheng will be presenting findings on diversity of homeschooling arrangements. And we will have opportunities after his talk uh, to ask questions. And in order to facilitate our communication and invite you all to send uh, comments in the chat, you can do it um, directly to me or the group. And I will uh, be sure to kind of organize all the questions and identify themes. And I want to thank uh, GHX for hosting this event. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Albert. Thank you, Albert. Thanks, Carlos. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I, uh, my screen's on, I guess. We can see it. Okay, great. Um, so great to be here with everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, and so uh, today I'd like to share some joint work that I've done with uh, Professor Daniel Hamlin at the University of Oklahoma. Um, and so this uh, paper that we've done, um, we've entitled um, a typology of contemporary homeschool arrangements an analysis of three ways of nationally representative data. Okay, so let me jump right into the paper and just motivate it a little bit. Um, and I'll start with a graph that I think uh, most of you are familiar with. Um, this is uh, data from the United States um, reporting the percentage of school-aged children who are homeschooled. Um, of course, there's a lot of different estimates out there, um, but this, this is, these are the estimates from the U.S. Department of Education. And uh, as you can see, uh, the first bar there, uh, about only 1.7% of school-aged children um, reported being homeschooled um, in 1999, and that's essentially doubled um, within the last uh, decade. Um, uh, I don't have the uh, latest official uh, numbers um, since the pandemic uh, from the U.S. Department of Education, but um, we've had uh, lots of estimates there. Um, I've seen estimates as large as 10%. Um, of course, we don't know exactly um, who is considering themselves a homeschooler, but um, certainly uh, the upward trend uh, for the past 20, 30 years is, is pretty obvious. Um, now, along with the growing popularity of homeschooling um, is a growing diversity of homeschooling. Um, I think a lot of you are also familiar with um, a range of new populations, um, not only in the U.S., but across the world that are uh, beginning to homeschool. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, because of the new diversity of homeschooling practice, uh, what this has done is led to some uh, challenges and probably some work that uh, we all need to do to uh, think through uh, what we mean by homeschooling and, and um, how to characterize the practice. Um, and so especially for research, uh, you know, in social science, we really rely on um, precise definitions, being clear about what we're talking about in our samples, uh, being um, clear about the practices we're talking about. Um, because of the, the new diversity in homeschooling and uh, the evolution of homeschooling practices, um, you know, we, we've faced some difficulty on that front. Um, and, and I should say that it's not only a diversity in um, uh, subpopulations across the world in, in each country that, that's homeschooling, um, but also uh, with the advent of new technology, um, you know, people that have been homeschooling for, for decades um, uh, have also changed their practices. And we can think of uh, the, the role that um, the internet and online learning has done, uh, what, what, that, what role that has played to, um, to, to, to modify the practice. And so um, I, I want to lay out some considerations here before I get into the data in the paper that Dan and I um, have done. Um, so I want to ground our, our discussion in um, Joe Murphy, Dr. Joe Murphy's work on homeschooling. Um, so he uh, um, has a, a 
fairly comprehensive book. Um, it's, I mean, it's getting a bit dated, but um, still a, a good resource, I think, that, that's worth referring to. Um, and uh, Dr. Murphy tries to define homeschooling um, using four uh, main characteristics. Um, so the first characteristic that Dr. Murphy um, identifies is that uh, for homeschooling or homeschoolers, the setting of the learning is primarily at home. Um, in other words, all the learning is centered around the home. It's done out of the home. Um, you know, students might uh, leave the home to, to uh, join co-ops or visit other places, but certainly the, the practice itself revolves around the home. Um, so the setting is the first key distinguishing characteristic of, um, of homeschooling. Um, the second characteristic um, that I've listed here on the, on the left-hand side um, is the funding source. And uh, Dr. Murphy argues that uh, the funding um, and all the resources for homeschooling comes primarily from the family, not from the state. Um, <clears throat> and so this certainly is, is a, a contrast from uh, traditional public schooling, for instance, where the, uh, the government um, pays the bulk of the, the costs of education. <clears throat> and then uh, thirdly, Dr. Murphy um, uh, identifies uh, an aspect of home, uh, identifies the provision of homeschooling as um, primarily uh, done by parents. Okay? And in other words, instruction is provided by parents and not by state employees. So these are, uh, for instance, your teachers in your uh, district or government run schools. Um, but also it's not from privately resourced employees. In other words, not in private schools. So that in other words, for, homeschool for homeschoolers, instruction is provided primarily um, by parents. Okay, and then fourthly, uh, a key aspect of homeschooling, according to, to Dr. Murphy, is that parents directly control um, the educational content. Um, uh, you know, this is certainly a, a contrast from uh, typical uh, state-run government public schooling, um, where the curriculum might be determined by the state, it might be determined um, by local school boards. Um, here for homeschooling, according to Dr. Murphy, parents directly control the content of, of the education. Um, now, I think the Dr. Murphy's um, definition is, is useful for us um, to think about how to characterize homeschooling. Um, but because of the increasing diversity of homeschooling, um, uh, both among populations and, and, uh, and among the, the practices that are, that are invoked, um, you know, we're beginning to kind of push the boundaries of um, a lot of these definitions. Um, so for instance, uh, 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 you know, recent uh, researchers and, and other pundits have um, talked about uh, uh, this large group of uh, uh, homeschoolers that spend um, a few days um, doing education at home. And then for the other few days of the week, they send their children to school. And so, uh, you know, we know this practice as hybrid homeschooling. Um, and so, you know, this, this uh, population of, of students and families is, is on the rise. Um, I actually uh, there's a there's a new private school here locally uh, that has that has opened with four years ago and a lot of their families um, do that they, they go to school maybe two to three days out of the week and then the other days they're, they're homeschooling um, and so you know once because of this new group of uh, families um, you know this get, get pushes uh, the limits of uh, dr. Murphy's um, conception of homeschooling you know is the in for these hybrid homeschoolers is the setting primarily at home um, you know, and if it's not, do we still consider them homeschooling? So anyway, there's some ambiguity here. Um, same thing with the funding um, aspect of homeschooling. So um, uh, there's new policy environments here in the United States, new policies that um, are, are being passed across the states. In particular, um, a lot of states here in the U.S. have what we call education savings accounts. And um, parents who participate in th these programs um, are given money from uh, the, the government, the state government. Uh, we actually have some new programs where the money comes from private donations. And essentially families in these programs get a savings account, a, 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 a new bank account with money in it every year. 
and they can spend that money on qualified education expenses. So they can spend it um, on tutors. They can spend it um, for private school tuition. They can spend it on curriculum, um, online classes. Uh, they can spend it on educational therapy, for instance. Um, and so uh, homeschoolers across the US have started to take advantage of uh, the education savings accounts. And again, this new development begins to bring some ambiguity to Dr. Murphy's definition. Um, is the funding primarily from the family then if homeschoolers avail themselves of education savings accounts? Um, likewise, for the, the third aspect of instruction being provided by parents, um, a lot of homeschooling families, as I've mentioned, are now beginning to partner more and more often with brick and mortar schools um, for educational activities, but also for extracurricular activities. Um, does the hiring of private tutors then begin to uh, create some ambiguity about um, whether instruction is primarily provided by the parents? Uh, again, these are practices that have been longstanding, um, but certainly with the increase of these practices, um, we begin to, to run into some um, uh, ambiguity with, with the definition. Um, and then, uh, you know, even you can even make a case for whether the control of educational content is um, as clean as Dr. Murphy uh, says it is, um, or, or would like to define homeschooling as. Um, certainly, if, if uh, you know, on, on one hand, if a parent joins a co-op or purchases a curriculum, um, to what extent are they still in control of, of the full curriculum? Um, certainly if parents uh, enroll some of their homeschooling kids in online courses or, or even college courses, um, correspondent school programs, to what extent um, is, is the control still there, right? So how, how far can we go um, in terms of uh, giving up curricular control to still consider the family homeschooling. So anyway, I, I wanna spend a, a little bit of time here um, uh, going through this a bit, you know, going through this gradually to raise the, the ambiguities that are um, all around us now. And, and this is certainly creating um, lots of challenges to do research um, because again, we need to define homeschooling uh, precisely to, to talk about it um, uh, using social science. Um, so uh, what Dan and I want to do in our paper is to try to bring some conceptual clarity to the study of homeschooling um, by proposing a typology of homeschoolers. Um, and so we want to propose uh, uh, four, uh, like a, a four uh, categories here of homeschoolers. And then what we're going to do in our paper is estimate um, how popular, how prevalent uh, these types of homeschoolings are in the United States. Okay, so the four homeschoolers that the four types of homeschooling uh, families that we want to identify are those that um, only supplement um, homeschooling with the use of a private tutor or a co op. Um, the second type, we want to identify homeschoolers that supplement uh, their instruction with online instruction and coursework. Um, third, uh, we want to estimate how popular or how prevalent um, uh, home education is, uh, uh, how popular is the uh, part-time enrollment in a brick and mortar school among homeschoolers. So how many homeschoolers are spending part of their time uh, enrolled in a, in a brick and mortar school and, and, and for the rest of the week, um, primarily doing instruction at home. Um, and then four uh, is the uh, kind of fully parent delivered home education. In other words, the per percentage of families that don't use any of the resources above here. So they don't use a tutor or don't participate in a co-op, don't use online instruction or a brick and mortar school. Okay, so um, here's our two research questions. Again, we wanna estimate how prevalent are the four types of homeschool arrangements? And then what we also are gonna do is um, what kind of socio-demographic background factors are associated with the different kinds of arrangements. So what kinds of families across the United States are practicing um, one of these, uh, each of these four types of, of homeschooling? 
Okay, so let me jump into the data. Um, so the data for this study come from the National Education National Household Education Surveys. Um, this is a uh, survey that's that's um, administered by the U.S. Department of Education, and we are going to take three different waves of the survey. We're going to take uh, data from an administration in 2012, 2016, and 2019. And if we combine everything. Um, I think Dan and I win the world record for the biggest um, sample size of um, homeschoolers at 1,468, if you combine all of them. Um, maybe there's another study out there that has more, but um, <laughs> uh, someone can point that out to us um, if they find that. Um, but anyway, if we combine all the data, um, we've got a large sample size. And what the U.S. Department of Education does is they uh, screen parents of all school-age children or, or a, a random sample of school-aged children, and then uh, pick a random child from that family. And essentially, if that uh, parent uh, reports that the child doesn't primarily attend public or private school, uh, then that child is identified as a homeschooler. Okay, And so of the 1,500 uh, uh, students in our sample, um, the, that's how the US Department of, Edu of Education identifies them. Um, and of course, we use sampling weights to, to make our results um, uh, nationally representative um, as, as, as best we can. Okay, so um, here's what we're going to do methods wise. Um, so for the first research question, it's a very straightforward uh, computation. We're just going to calculate the percentage of homeschool families that fall into each of our four categories. Um, again, the categories are listed there, um, you know, whether parents use a private tutor or a co-op online education, uh, enroll part-time in a brick and mortar school or use none of the above. Okay, and then for the second research question, we're gonna run um, a series of logistic regression models to predict, um, uh, to, to determine predictors of a particular type of homeschooling family. So in other words, I mean, uh, so, so the equation we're gonna estimate is listed here. Um, y is the type of homeschool arrangement and then as you can see, we're going to, on the right-hand side, list um, different characteristics to see if they're associated with um, using a particular homeschooling arrangement. So for instance, um, this variable elementary is a uh, variable indicating if the child in the sample is in elementary school or, or is in, a, in, a, in an elementary school grade. In other words, we can estimate um, whether being a younger child is going to be associated with um, using a private tutor or participating in a brick and mortar school, for instance. Um, uh, bachelors is um, an indicator for if the parents are college educated. So we can estimate whether parents who are college educated are more likely to use one of the four um, arrangements. Um, I mean, I'll just walk through each of them. You know, are, are boys, uh, homeschooled kids who are boys more likely to be in one um, or another of these kinds of arrangements? Um, we have an indicator for race. Um, urban is the, um, uh, the setting where they live. Um, income, so whether uh, household income is associated with uh, practicing homeschooling in a particular way. Uh, the region of the United States, so are they from the Northeast, from the South, from the West, from the Midwest? Um, and then also if, if the reasons, their motivations for homeschooling is going to be associated with any of their uh, any of the particular kinds of practices. Okay, so um, let, let's jump right into the results. Um, so first, I'll just show you a uh, table of summary statistics for each of the three waves of our data. And so I have three columns uh, across the table, and and uh, each column reports the um, percentage of homeschoolers in that particular year. And so for instance, um, in, in, in the 2012 wave of our data, uh, half of homeschooling kids were male. And as you can see, it's actually about half uh, male, the other half being female across each wave. Um, you'll also notice that um, the grade of the child, um, it turns out that uh, across all the years, uh, we have a higher percentage of uh, homeschooling uh, children in the higher grades. Okay, so for instance, about 10% uh, 
of uh, child, homeschool children are in the eighth grade um, in 2012, whereas it's only 3% in the first and second grade. Okay, and that trend pretty much holds up throughout the, the year, although um, things tend to even out um, in 2019. Okay, um, I'll also point out, uh, for instance, the, the change in, in racial composition, um, uh, certainly a growth, at least in this data for, um, uh, for Hispanic families. Um, we're not quite sure what's going on in 2016. We definitely saw this big drop among uh, white families. Um, uh, again, I want to caution um, too much interpretation of the data. I mean, if you're having a, uh, an unusual result for just one year might be, is, is, is possible. But uh, I just want to point that out and we might be able to discuss that um, uh, later during Q&A. Um, the other uh, thing I want to point out is uh, certainly if you look at the um, parents' education level, um, so most homeschooling, most homeschoolers uh, or most homeschooling parents um, do have a, a college degree or some kind of college experience, although that's not always true. There's uh, a noticeable percentage of homeschooling parents who um, uh, don't even have a high school degree or just have only completed high school. Okay, um, just a few more summary statistics. Um, as you can see, here's the breakdown by income, uh, by region, by uh, locale, and then the reasons for homeschooling. Um, so I'll, I'll point out uh, here, there might be uh, uh, some kind of change in the, um, over time in the reasons for homeschooling. Um, you'll notice that uh, the um, percentage, first of all, the most popular reason for homeschooling is concerns about safety, school safety. Um, uh, in 2012, that's 90% of families. And it's kind of decreased over the years. And what has increased um, uh, to replace that? Um, I think a lot of it might be in, in uh, children with uh, health or special need. And then also uh, an increasing number of parents who are interested in a non-traditional educational approach. There's, there seems to be some kind of growth in, in those two um, areas over time. Um, uh, but other than that, you know, you can kind of uh, take, a, take a peek at these, these numbers. Um, I do have the paper up online too, so you can look at these numbers in more detail if you'd like. Um, table two is, is a separate table just to report um, uh, the average number of years of homeschooling. So how, um, how many years do families, do, do children spend homeschooling? Um, and as you can see here, um, most families don't spend, um, or most children <coughs> don't spend the um, bulk of their education. So, um, uh, I mean, obviously in kindergarten, everyone spends one year in homeschooling because that's the only year of schooling that they had. Um, but even if you go to uh, look at some uh, kids in the seventh grade, the average seventh grader um, has only spent four years of their schooling in homeschooling. And so there's definitely a lot of switching from homeschooling and out of homeschooling. Um, uh, if you look at 12th graders in the sample, um, the average is only about uh, five years. And so um, even among 12th graders in the US, um, they're spending on average less than half of their full school, K-12 schooling, um, homeschooling. Okay, so um, let me get to the, the main results of our, our main research questions here. And so this, again, our first research question is to um, estimate uh, the proportion of families that um, belong to a particular homeschooling arrangement. Okay, so um, for instance, the way, so, so I have this broken out by year. So for instance, um, what percentage of homeschooling families use a private tutor or um, belong to a cooperative. Um, over time, it's about, it's near half. So about half of homeschooling families um, either hire a private tutor or participate in a cooperative. Um, I, I've uh, broken the results out uh, even further. As you can see, um, uh, more families um, belong to a cooperative than use a private tutor. So um, for instance, in 2016, 15% of homeschooling families use, have hired a private uh, tutor only. 
However, 20% of homeschooling families belong to a cooperative. Um, 10% uh, use both. They, they belong to a cooperative and um, have hired a private tutor. Um, and so as you can see, uh, the use of um, uh, a cooperative seems to have, um, uh, there seems to be an increase um, in, uh, in 2019. Um, and it's a commensurate decrease um, among those who only use a private tutor. And we do have uh, more families using both as well. Okay, so it does seem that over time, homeschooling families um, are availing themselves of, of cooperatives um, with more frequency, um, maybe by a little bit. Um, type two, uh, how many, what percentage of homeschool families use online instruction? Uh, in 2012 and 2016, it was about one third of families, um, homeschooling families who use online instruction. That uh, number seems to have increased um, in the latest wave in 2019. Okay, and um, in the next two rows, I also uh, disaggregate these results by um, families who uh, use online instruction with and without a private tutor or um, a homeschool cooperative. And um, uh, as you can see here, about 14 to 19 percent of families um, only use online instruction. The other um, uh, 18 to 20 percent um, use online instruction and a private tutor or belong to a homeschool cooperative. Okay, and so there is a, a substantial group of families that are availing themselves of all of these resources, co-ops, private tutors, and online instruction, um, but there's still a fair amount using only online instruction. And certainly this, this uh, increasing trend probably is, isn't surprising given um, how much the, uh, how, how the availability of online resources has, has really expanded. Okay, um, and then type three is, uh, so what percentage of homeschool families spend part of their time enrolled in a brick and mortar school? Um, it's about one quarter to one third. Um, so in 2012 and 2019, it's just above 25% of homeschool families that do that. It uh, shot up to about 32% in, in 2016. Okay, and uh, what's interesting here is we have data on how much time per week they spend in formal school. And so um, uh, in 2012 and 2016, for instance, about half of the families spent less than 10 hours a week in uh, brick and mortar school. That number has dropped to about one third, 36%. And um, what's replaced that really are families that are spending over 24 hours per week in brick and mortar school. And so, um, whereas it was only about one quarter of families who spent uh, over 24 hours a week in school in 2012, that the, per the percentage of those families um, has now increased to um, you know, nearly 40% now. And so um, that, that, that's certainly, this, uh, this trend is certainly consistent with the um, the rise of uh, you know hybrid homeschoolings hi hybrid homeschooling that that's um, that we've been recently observing. Okay, and then finally, type four: what percentage of families don't use any of the arrangements? Um, this is a uh, uh, kind of on a downward trend. Um, fewer and fewer homeschooling families, it seems, um, don't use any of the resources that that are listed above. Um, that uh, about one third of families didn't use any of those resources in 2012, and now it's decreased down to about um, one fifth, you know, 20% in 2019. Okay, so this is really a picture of um, uh, homeschooling families broken out by the kinds of resources and practices that they, they rely on. Okay, um, and let me walk you through this last table. Um, so again, the second research question is what kinds of families are more likely to belong to a particular kind of arrangement? Okay, and um, I'll point out some interesting patterns here. Um, so the way to read this table, these are logistic reg regression questions and or regressions. Um, so any uh, estimate that is below one means that um, the fact that kind of uh, student is less likely to be in that arrangement. Okay, so these are odds ratios. Um, so in other words, um, just to 
I'll give you an example. Um, so you see here, uh, the coefficient for white students is 1.27, okay? And so what this is saying is that um, uh, homeschooling kids who are, um, are white are 1.27 times more likely than other students to use a private tutor or belong to a cooperative, okay? So numbers greater than one means they're more likely numbers less than one means they're, they're less likely. And so uh, white students, more educated parents are more likely to use a private tutor or belong to a co-op. Um, so it's about one, you know, uh, parents with a, a bachelor's degree are about 1.5 times more likely to uh, use a private tutor or belong to a cooperative. Um, here for region, um, everything here is uh, relative to the South. So uh, families living in the Northeast of the United States and families living in the West of the United States are more likely than families in the South to use a private tutor or belong to a cooperative, okay? Um, so anyway, that's, that's certainly some of the results for uh, using a cooperative, uh, white families, more educated families from the Northeast and West. Uh, those are the kinds of families that use private tutors and belong to a co or belong to a co-op. Um, looking to the second column, what kinds of families are more likely to use online instruction? Well, first of all, one thing to note is that younger homeschool children are less likely than older homeschool children to use online instruction. Okay, so you see the coefficient here is about 0.4, right? And so, so they're, they're much less likely, almost half um, as likely to, uh, so, so younger children are, are, are over half as likely half less likely uh, than, um, or I should say, I'm, I'm mixing up all my um, half and twice, you know, they're, they're half as likely than, than older students to, to use um, uh, online instruction, um, which, which I think is consistent with what we've observed, right? So typically, um, as, you know, as, as older, as, as kids get older and start taking um, uh, advanced courses, um, a lot of parents then begin to rely on um, online courses or, or curriculum to, to provide that kind of instruction. So certainly this pattern um, is consistent with what we, what we observe. Um, also, what's interesting here is um, families who uh, homeschool because of a desire for religious or moral instruction um, or families with, uh, of children with special needs or a health issue, um, these families are also less likely to use online instruction. Um, so anyway, I think that that's interesting. I, you know, I didn't expect that, um, you know, welcome uh, commentary on that, if, if any of you have that. Um, let's move on to the third column. Uh, what kinds of families, homeschooling families, spend part of their week in brick and mortar school? Um, as you can see here, uh, younger students are less likely to spend time in brick and mortar school. Also, white students are less likely to uh, spend part of their time in, in brick and mortar school. Um, uh, same thing with parents with, with a uh, bachelor's degree. Um, homes, you know, uh, homeschooling families where the parent has a bachelor's degree seem to be less likely to send their kid uh, part time to a brick and mortar school. Um, however, uh, homeschooling families that live in urban areas are about 1.3 times more likely than other parents to uh, enroll part-time in, in a brick and mortar school. And, and certainly that, that might be consistent with the idea that um, look, a lot of these schools are, are mostly located in, in um, uh, more urban or suburban areas relative to, to rural areas. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, parents who decided to homeschool, if you look at this, this row here, uh, parents who decide to homeschool because they were concerned about a safe school environment are less likely to uh, send their kid to a brick and mortar school. And I hope that makes sense, right? If you homeschool because you were worried about the school environment, perhaps why would you send your child back to school for part of the week? Um, so some of these results are, are cer certainly um, as expected. Um, lastly, what kinds of families use none of these educational supplements? Um, seems like younger children, okay? Uh, homeschooling families with younger children uh, seem to, to uh, do it kind of themselves. Um, white families are a bit more likely to do that. 
Um, and then also uh, parents without a college degree um, seem to be the ones that are doing that as well. So, um, uh, and, and also I should point out, it looks like it's more popular in the South as well. You notice all these coefficients are less than one. And so um, it looks like families um, in the South, Southern region of the United States are more likely to um, uh, not use any of these resources that we're considering here. Um, so anyway, I'll summarize and conclude and, and look forward to the discussion. Um, I think a few takeaways. Uh, first, uh, there's a large and increasing majority of homeschooling families that are supplementing their homeschooling practice. Um, they're relying on co-ops and tutors and online education and even brick and mortar schools. Um, but there's still a substantial proportion of homeschoolers, um, you know, about one fifth that, that don't use any of these um, resources. Um, certainly the uh, selection of the homeschool arrangement is not random. Um, uh, you know, edu parent educational background, race, the child's age, uh, motivations, and the, the region in which these families live, uh, they, they explain whether um, families avail themselves of any one of these um, types of resources or none. Um, and so finally, I think from, from a research perspective, um, you know, I think what Dan and I would like to encourage is uh, others to perhaps refine this typology and, um, uh, and perhaps if we kind of can identify other subgroups of homeschoolers or people who, who do um, homeschooling-like practices, um, we can study uh, potential heterogeneities and outcomes. Um, I think it'd be interesting to, to look at um, uh, how each kind of student in, in each, so how students in each kind of homeschooling arrangement um, fare. Um, you know, each, each arrangement might have its advantages or disadvantages. In, in a particular way. Um, so anyway, I'll uh, end, end there and um, look forward to uh, Q&A. Okay, thank, thank you, Albert, for, for sharing that. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, okay. So I, I've got a few questions here. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start off with one thing that I sort of see in the chat. Um, is that all of these data were collected pre-COVID? Yeah. Um, and I was wondering your thoughts about you know, how things might look the same or different, you know, if these data were collected, let's say in a year from now. Yeah, well, that's, that's anybody's guess. Um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, I, I imagine, um, you know, I, I have a student here that's actually doing some work on the latest COVID uh, uh, or, or the, the latest selections of parent schooling arrangements. Um, so we're just coming out of the pandemic. And um, uh, I don't want to misquote her, but um, uh, I, I think she's, you know, I better not guess because I don't want to misquote her. So I, I mean, I'll, I'll maybe share that study um, later on. I actually don't remember all her particular findings. Um, and so, uh, but if, if I had to guess, um, I don't know, you're making me guess on the, <laughs> uh, on, on the fly here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd imagine um, folks availing themselves of more of these kinds of things. And I think we'll see more diversity. Um, I say that because in the US, um, we are uh, um, seeing um, more education savings accounts uh, policies passed, for instance. And so homeschoolers are then um, uh, availing themselves of extra funding. Um, sources to um, resources to do homeschooling and they're customizing their education more. Um, and uh, so I think there is this appetite in general to customize education, to use new resources that are out there. Um, so my guess is I think we would see more um, families using a variety of resources. It, it, on that note about the, the, the funding, uh, Mike had a question. And so I'm going to allow, if, Mike, if you can unmute and ask you the question you had in the chat, that'd be great. Hey, Carlos, I asked a number of questions. Which was the one? <laughs> the, the first question about uh, the education saving accounts. Seems like oh, yeah. funding. That one, yeah. that one, yeah. By the way, Albert, thank you so much. Fantastic research. Really, uh, this is the first I've seen this. So I am very excited about um, the findings you have here. And 
I think this is something that uh, needs to be looked at, especially as was just discussed with this this COVID, the yeah. COVIDian or the COVID crop of homeschoolers. So, so many interesting things. Um, yeah. So, um, and I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so excited about this research. Let me find it in the chat. Where did I put that? Uh, ESAs. Oh, funding. Yeah. So yeah, your typologies, yeah. you know, you use Murphy's four, four part typology or, or yeah. definition, which I think is really important. I mean, I think your point about we've got to define homeschooling carefully so we can understand what is and what isn't. And those lines are really being blurred, as you mentioned with the ESAs. But it seems to me this idea of funding is one way we can really draw a bright line. You know, if it's privately um, funded, then that's homeschooling, right? That's at least that's how traditionally it's been understood. And it seems like that's a line that needs to be maybe maintained. Maybe would you as a social scientist or as a researcher, do you, I mean, how flexible, I guess, can these lines be? How much can we gray these different categories and, and still retain the ability to differentiate? That's kind of, I guess, what my question was. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, when, when Dan and I were doing the study, um, I mean, we were su- kind of surprised. We didn't know what to, we, we, we didn't uh, know what we, exactly what we would find. Um, uh, you know, you, we just kind of hear anecdotes of families um, using these resources or not using the res- these resources. And I think we've just become, um, you know, even more surprised at how complicated and nuanced the picture is. And um, so, I, you know, I don't, because of that complexity, I wonder if we just need to be careful of clarifying things all the time now. Um, um, uh, you know, to, just to use the word homeschooler, um, it seems really insufficient now um, to to really describe and name the population you're you're talking about. Um, and so um, I think from, from a, certainly from a social scientific perspective, you know, if we're interested in um, precisely defining terms and describing our sample, um, you know, I think we do need to add all these kind of adjectives <laughs> to, to what we're describing. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, even if we're not even doing social science, um, perhaps when we're talking about it with people, um, you know, we probably have to clarify what we mean. Um, you know, I, I, there's probably folks on one extreme that might, um, you know, if you say homeschooling, they're going to think they're like just a bunch of, you know, uh, families that are, you know, they have like these stereotypes, these kind of negative stereotypes of these families. And, you know, with this research, we can say, like, actually, no, it's, you know, homeschooling isn't just this fringe group, like these are people that are, you know, using online resources like any kids. You've got kids even, you know, participating, spending some time in school and um, belonging to other networks of co-ops. And so, you know, I, I think there's value in, in trying to describe all this. Um, and, and I think, you know, with the lack of language now to, that can catch up to the nuance, um, yeah, my best solution is to simply like qualify and clarify what we mean when we say it. Thank you. Another question that came up in the chat, and I was looking at your tables, and I think South was the comparison group. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if right. you could kind of speak more into why why was that done? Did you try other uh, comparison groups? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, um, uh, I mean the. You know, Dan and I would joke like, "Hey, we're in the South, so we should we should be the, the main cat." No, but you know, that's not the reason. Um, no, I, I think we we chose that just to um, highlight the distinction there. Um, so if if you switch around the comparison groups, um, uh, you know, you can still you get the same kind of general patterns of results. But um, I think it was definitely striking that the South seemed to stand out, and so we wanted to highlight that in our presentation. And Albert, are you able to ch- see the chat function? Or, or, I'm yeah, sorry, I, can. Um, I can. Do you, I can, do you want to take that the first the one at 738 uh, question? Um, let's see. So 730. That is, oh, from Danielle? 
I'm seeing it from Bridget. Oh, no. If using a traditional school auction as a primary, that one. Uh, maybe best you read it. I, okay. Um, if using so Bridget asks if using a traditional school auction as primary twenty four hours, would that not be a public school option or part time? So I think it's kind of yeah. 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 Um, and so uh, so keep in mind one that um, it's it's per week so. I mean, I suppose that that is quite a lot, right? If you spend 24 hours per week, five days a week, that's four to five hours um, every day. Um, but again, this is, I think this is part of the complexity, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, what should we call these kinds of families? Um, uh, you know, are they homeschoolers? Some might self-identify as homeschoolers, some don't. Um, you know, it's fair to, uh, call them part-time school at home. Um, uh, again, I, I don't have a great answer. I think this is, uh, in characterizing it, you know, whether you call it homeschooling or not, or part-time schooling or not, uh, I, I think the, the issue is that there are these families and, you know, what do we want to call them? And so, you know, to kind of go back to my answer to Mike, um, you know, we, I, I, we just have to use more words yeah. perhaps to describe um, the kinds of families we're, we're talking about. Um, and, and I think we, one more question here in terms of like, how are we defining homeschoolers? Because I do think this is going to be increasingly important. And I think it was Brian in, in the Q&A asked this question for Mike, but I'll maybe let you take a first yeah. shot at it. We, we think from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, how important is this? You know, I mean, I get like as researchers, we, we can define things, we can maybe deal with a fair amount of ambiguity, but I think, um, you know, different groups of people that are interested in our findings may have maybe a greater yeah. need for, 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 for clarity, for precision. Yeah. Uh, maybe just your thoughts on, on that. Yeah. What's the implications of this? Well, you know, I, I think the best way is if we want to get into like, how, to, how, how, what, how do we um, engage in policy with, with this? Um, so I think a lot of policy, um, you know, policies are usually very targeted. Um, and so what I mean, for instance, is um, uh, in states where they're debating education's sa education savings accounts, for instance, we're really talking about families who would avail themselves of that resource. And so, and some of them um, are homeschoolers that then uh, avail themselves of that money. Um, some are traditional public schoolers that leave. Um, and so uh, I think when we talk policy then, um, you have to talk about it, strictly speaking, in terms of the ESA arrangement. Um, you know, you, you might say as a part of that debate that there are homeschooling families there, but um, it's irrelevant, I think, to paint with too broad a brush to to lump in all homeschoolers into that debate about ESAs because not all homeschoolers will use ESAs. Um, and so, you know, I think from a policy perspective, um, I, I, again, I, I think being clear about who we're talking about here. So, you know, again, like just to illustrate another point, um, uh, you know, with, with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bartlett's um, call for presumptive ban, um, you know, she's using the word homeschooling um, with a huge broad brush. And I think with this study, um, um, you know, an easy response to her is like, can, you know, describe the population you're actually talking about here. Um, if you're going to, if you're talking about the population, if, if when, what you mean by homeschooling is people who don't use any resources, um, at most in our data, that's just 20% 20, 20 of homeschoolers. And, and by the way, that 20% could be using other resources that we just don't have data for, um, right? What we have here are 20% of homeschoolers that don't hire tutors, don't belong to a co-op, don't use online instruction or don't go to a brick and mortar school. They could be using other things. And so, you know, policy-wise, um, I think the finer grain you can get in qualifying who you're talking about, I think that brings a lot more clarity. And so, you know, this call for a presumptive ban, um, you know, it's an easy retort to say, like, explain more who you're talking about here. And then from our data, at least, you can say that, hey, look, um, it's like 
at most 20% of the students, if that's what you have in mind, um, maybe less. Right? Let me zoom out here at a different question. We, mm -hmm. we are the Global Home Education Exchange. There's a question about um, any similar data in Canada that you're aware of. Oh, yeah, I don't. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I want to know. I mean, the only. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to I don't actually know if the Canadian government um, collects some of this data, maybe some of the provincial governments collect some data. Um, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll drop Dini Van Pelt's name, she might know. Um, uh, certainly with, with my work with Cardis, I know Cardis has tried to collect some data about homeschoolers in Canada, but um, you know, the sample they got was, was very small. Um, and so, uh, and certainly they don't ask about practices and arrangements, um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't know, I mean, I'd explore the provincial governments maybe, maybe they have some okay. data. Another question here that I had, uh, I was thinking about your table and you had the duration or the number of years homeschooling yep. by grade. And I yep. actually think that was one of the most fascinating parts of your mm -hmm. talk, uh, right? Because even when you go to uh, 12th graders, I think the average was somewhere around five. Yeah, five, like right, that, right? 5.5, 5, yeah. So I don't know, um, you know, with what you presented, you can kind of get at what, what's happening there. But I was just wondering if you've seen other data or um, yeah. have done additional analyses, maybe in a year, you're going to come back with the, ne the next talk yeah. um, about, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what's happening? Because I think, you know, part of what is interesting to me about that is, I think it's still like 80%, 70 or so percent of their data are saying like, parents are doing this for pretty foundational core reasons, like mm -hmm. religious reasons. They're really yeah. concerned about school safety. Yep. Yeah. These are things that don't seem to me that change rapidly. Yeah. And yeah. yet these schooling arrangements are, are sort of in flux for a lot. So yeah. you maybe yeah. speak to that issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly so on the, on, the, on the issue of um, are there other data? So Dan and I, in uh, another paper that we just had come out in the Journal of School Choice, we um, use another data set, the Understanding America study. And... Um, uh, they, uh, so we basically find similar patterns there that, um, you know, very few, it's a minority of home, uh, of families who have ever homeschooled, who homeschool that, uh, you know, a single child for the majority of, um, their school, their, their, their K-12 education. Um, so, and a lot of families do this for one or two years. It's, um, you know, a sporadic thing. I mean, I guess I can think of some of my friends, you know, in elementary school, I, I, we were good friends. And then uh, when we got to summer after fourth grade, my best friend stopped coming to school. I'm like, wait, where'd he go? And he still lived in the same house down the street. And then um, I saw him again when we reached junior high. And so, um, yeah, there, I mean, there are a lot of families who, uh, it, it seems like the majority of families homeschool for um, a brief stint. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to, to really unpack those reasons more and more. Um, I think that'll flesh out the, the picture. Um, I'll also just on, on one point, another point on that, I think that also raises the complexity of what we mean by homeschooling. Um, so a family, so let's say we have an adult who was homeschooled only one year or an adult who was homeschooled for half of K-12 or an adult who was homeschooled for all years, um, are they all homeschoolers? You know, we certainly when we do research um, uh, of adults and then kind of want to look at their schooling background, we have to code the data a certain way. Um, you know, how many years of homeschooling do you need to be considered a formerly homeschooled adult? Is it one or all or majority. Um, and I think changing that, certainly I think if you run regressions and compute means and things like that, do statistics on that, you'll get maybe some kind of different pictures from that. And so again, that, that's just another layer of complexity, I think that's, that's here. I think a related issue is I think as somebody that studies development is, you know, how children, you know, either stay the same or change over time. Um, am I correct that these data were all cross-sectional, right? We, you can't yeah. sort of look at the, you know, uh, longitudinal relations like this. Um, but I was, you know, was wondering, um, 
if you know of any data or if you were able to kind of look at this in your data in terms of maybe how some of these things change as a function of age in a finer grain way. I think you had that, that elementary, which caps kind of a yeah. five or six grades. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at it in a finer grained way um, because I, I could see sort of, sort of motivations changing, implications mm. changing. Yeah. You know, and I think the paper that my colleagues and I had come out recently in child development perspectives, yeah. we kind of spoke to this about yeah. you know, maybe parents use co-ops differently yeah. Yeah. for younger versus older kids. So yeah. any, any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, you know, it'd be great if um, to, you know, somehow put together some kind of longitudinal um data set, you know, where you follow a, a family um, over time. Uh, I mean, you're getting my wheels turning. Actually, I, I can think of some uh, old, so the National Study of Youth and Religion, I think is, uh, is a data set um, run out of Notre Dame, nationally representative. I think they had uh, seventh, they followed kids from seventh to 12th grade, or maybe through high school. Um, and it was longitudinal. And I think they had uh, that you could observe people switching in and out of homeschooling there. Um, I don't know if there's something there, but uh, certainly I think, I think, you know, if somehow we could invest resources, um, I don't know, get a grant or something to, <laughs> uh, I mean, this will be a ton of effort, you know, to, to create a longitudinal data set and follow the same families over years. I think that would yield a lot of insight to, to your point. All right, so let's do that. And then I'm going to blend that idea about uh, getting a grant <laughs> to do that with a question that I'm seeing in the chat or uh, sort of encouragement to, uh, this is from Kathleen. So if I get your question wrong, Kathleen, feel free to unmute yourself and, and chime in here. But you know, this is a great work using uh, quantitative methods. Your thoughts on how to advance the study of homeschooling from a qualitative methods perspective. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think to uh, to your point, I mean, the a the understanding the switching in and out of of homeschooling is is great, and I think the the natural question certainly to ask um, from the study I just did is um, uh, to to get a, a clear picture of um, what are the actual practices that are there, right? So, for instance, I only observe um, whether parents say they use some kind of online resources. Um, you know, what are those resources? Or what, um, how much time do they spend on, the re on those resources? Why are they choosing those resources? How did they find those resources? Um, I mean, you know, there's, a, and that's just with online resources, you could ask the similar kinds of questions for um, part-time schooling. How do you find a tutor? What do you do in a co-op? Um, uh, you know, to do all this qualitative research to tell the story of what's of what's underneath um, those those uh, subpopulations of homeschoolers, um, you could I mean we could get some really rich data there um, to to describe the practice in more detail. All right, so I'm going to invite the fellow panelists. I think we've touched on the all the questions or at least the themes associated with the questions but um if so, if i missed something if one of my fellow panelists can can chime in i would welcome your your, your input um and mike is coming in so i'm gonna hey, carl did i didn't catch it uh, i was just looking at this very vibrant chat here but did we <laughs> answer larissa mcdonald's uh question about five hours in a brick and mortar school considered homeschooling did you address that that's for clear maybe i missed that one she says, how is almost five hours per day in a brick and mortar school still considered homeschooling? It would make more sense to say that supplement their child's education at home. Many families do this without claiming to homeschool. And there was someone in the chat who actually said that that was the case. They understood that they weren't homeschooling. And, and another person in the chat mentioned about sports activity. So forgive me if I missed the conversation on that. I was a little distracted at one point. Yeah, I mean, so on the sports note, um, uh, I mean, so so there's plenty of quality. I think there's qualitative research on this. Um, so an anecdotally, um, uh, right, that uh, some homeschooling families, um, you know, they they partner with. Actually, I remember I just, I just, now I'm remembering my childhood. <laughs> you know, that there's I remember a, there was a, a good friend who uh, stopped coming to school in fifth grade, and then. 
um, in fifth grade, she showed up for PE um, all of a sudden, like, whoa, <laughs> what is this? And so we have um, certainly that and, and at the, uh, the higher grades, um, certainly partnerships between homeschooling families and their, their district schools or other private schools to play sports. Um, I don't have data on, on sports participation, um, but that's a big part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as, again, the question on five hours of homeschooling, right, for families who spend more than 24 hours, um, right, the question is what to do with that. Um, so on, on one hand, all of these families uh, report, or they characterize their kid as not spending the majority of their time in brick and mortar school, um, right? Uh, and so somehow so there's a, percentage of families that would say that and spend on average, you know, almost five hours a day in brick and mortar school. You know, I, I don't know how to make sense, which is, by the way, is, would be another great qualitative research question. Let's find some of these kinds of families and ask them, um, right, so how do you understand, uh, do you, would you say you're homeschooling your kid? How do you understand that, right, um, and, and get their perspective on it? It might be very interesting to, to understand that. Um, you know, and then on the other hand, I mean, uh, remember I showed the graph of the 3% right, of families who are homeschooling. Um, the, the result, all, all those percentages in the beginning, when we keep citing like the uh, percentage of homeschooling families has doubled from 1.7 to 3.4%. Um, those data, it seems, include these kinds of families as well. And so, um, you know, on one hand, uh, I suppose if we were to you know, not count them as homeschooling, we would see some of the numbers drop a bit. Um, but then again, it's like, how do we think about this? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, we could have a long discussion of what we should call them or simply say, um, these are families that, I don't know, part-time schooling, part-time homeschooling, I don't know. I mean, all the words, um, well, to cite T.S. Eliot, you know, words strain and crack, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, forget the rest of the line, but anyway. Well, so quick question. There's a question in the a, a Q and A about how many families do you think you would need to um, work with over time in a longitudinal study? Oh. Um, in order to address some of these questions. And I know that that could be a complex question. So like your yeah. second version uh, of what, what would you want? Yeah, I mean, you know, the more the merrier. Um, uh, I mean, you can do some stuff with, you know, 400 is pretty good. Um, I mean, we want to, you know, the, uh, the national, uh, study of youth and religion that I mentioned, um, that's, I think, I think they're well over a thousand. I, I, I don't recall exactly what it was, but I, that's my recollection. I could be wrong. Um, it could be more, um, certainly with Cardis, um, you know, in Cardis, it's a full sample of the Cardis Education Survey is, uh, uh, you know, between 1,000 and 2,000, but um, the homeschoolers are a very small group. They're only, it's only like 100 or so. Um, and, and that feels too small to, to do some, I mean, you're kind of underpowered there st yeah. statistically. Yeah. Um, but maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's a place to, you know, you start with, uh, maybe a smaller study with a good quantitative, yeah. qualitative, uh, you know, feel to yeah. be able to get a better understanding of before you launch out into these extremely yeah. expensive yeah. studies. Yeah. Actually, I, th I think that's, that's probably the way to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, for, so for folks who, who are doing, who do qualitative, actually, it sounds like a perfect mixed methods study, right? You do a, get a, a sample of, I don't know, 30 families might seem um, uh, manageable and, and try to follow them um for the over the course of five years maybe um yeah. at the same so do interviews periodically through that do uh have them complete some questionnaires and i think you'd be have a nice really nice mix, mixed yeah. method study um where you can directly observe change and the, yeah. the entire story right of of that family of that kid as they age through um doing homeschooling or, or whatnot so let me ask one more question here, um, going back a little bit to some of the details, but I think this is really important. Um, uh, Anna asked about uh, why did you merge the private tutor and homeschool cooperative in the same typology? 
Um, and how do home school cooperatives essentially work in the U.S.? Um, yeah. Good, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so what, what Dan and I did, I mean, our, our thought, original thought there was um, uh, the practice of uh, hiring a private tutor or joining a homeschool co-op. Um, those seem to be um, uh, fairly conventional, um, you know, early on in homeschooling. So when we're talking into the kind of modern resurgence of it in the 70s and 80s, um, right? Co-ops and, and tutors were the thing. And so we, we decided to lump those together um, to contrast that from uh, online learning, um, which is certainly a more modern or more even more recent development, um, you know, 19, late, nine, late 90s to early 2000s and onward. Um, and then we separated the brick and mortar school uh, type families, um, you know, obviously that feels different, um, but also it um, uh, lines up with the kind of more recent phenomena of um, hybrid homeschooling. And so we, we thought that those three cut categories kind of sat well with the historical developments of homeschooling. Um, you know, you could make an easy, a great argument that we should have separated um, the private schoolers from the co-ops um, and we did break out um, some of those results. And so you could kind of see, uh, you know, what, what um, uh, you know, the percentage of families only doing private schooling and only doing co-ops or doing both. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fair point. L last question here. Yeah. Gail asks, how is unschooling and SDE represented in this? Uh, S ooh, SDE. I'm not sure what SDE is. So maybe, maybe start with unschooling and if Gail wants self directed to education. education. There self directed you go. education. Yep. Yeah, Thank I you. see. I see. Yeah. Um, so certainly there are families in there that would be considered unschoolers. Uh, there actually is um, data in the US Department of Education survey um, that asks parents to describe. Um, whether they use a formal curriculum and whether um, uh, learning is mostly student directed or not. And so if you can, uh, actually this is Ari and um, Oz's work um, to try to separate out um, kind of formal, informal and formal curriculum and pedagogy. And then so the informal, the combination of informal pedagogy and curriculum you know, that would kind of be the, I think that's where unschoolers would, would land. And um, uh, so certainly those folks are in the data. Um, yeah, Dan and I just haven't, uh, we didn't, you know, break out that, um, but they're in there. Um, and I assume, you know, if you're uh, certainly being true to unschooling, um, you know, I, I doubt you would, you're probably not going to be in the online learning category. You're probably not going to be the in you're probably going to be in that last category, my guess is, um, where you don't use any of the resources we, we discussed in our paper. Okay, I, I looks like we've touched on, the, on all the key themes. So um, I just want to thank you, Albert, for um, sharing the findings. Thank you, Dan, for, for you know, contributing as well, because I know he was an important part of this. Yeah. Um, and all of you for joining me, whether it's uh, early in the morning or later in the afternoon, we certainly uh, appreciate everybody's engagement. Um, and maybe Albert, I'll give you the last word if there's one like last thought you want to end with, and then we can we can conclude the meeting. Uh, yeah, not, I mean, nothing profound, just a, just a thanks. I really enjoyed um, uh, my time here and, you know, kind of trying to peek at the chat while, uh, at the same time and, and uh, really appreciate all your your comments, um, lots of uh, comments are, are even thought provoking for me and we just can't um, touch on all of those. And so I uh, just wanna let you know that folks who are chatting in there and maybe feel like they don't, didn't get their comment addressed or anything that, um, uh, yeah, you know, I uh, do notice uh, many of them um, and, and they are definitely helpful even for me um, to think through, which is I think the part of the point of all this too, um, to, uh, all of, you know, hopefully all of us um, come out uh, thinking a bit more clearly and more rigorously about, about everything. Well, thank you again, Albert. And quick uh, thanks to Kareem, who is um, 
so uh, graciously translating all of our thoughts on the fly. So thank you, uh, Kareem, for, for doing that. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye.